Welcome back. I'm Steve Brunton, and this is another video in our lecture series on understanding COVID-19 through the lens of control theory. And today I'm going to specifically talk about the importance of measuring our system of taking, of, of sensing and measuring our system to make better control decisions and to inform better models. So in the last few lectures, we've talked a lot about this overarching control diagram, how we have our disease system, this unstable spread uh, of this disease as it goes through a population, and our efforts to take actions to control this spread, in this case to, to bring it below the healthcare capacity. Uh, and in this lecture, what I'm going to point out is the importance of measurements in this system. Okay, So this, this large feedback control diagram that I'm showing is predicated on the availability of accurate, fast measurements. So measurements, sensor measurements, are the lifeblood of feedback control, and they are what allow us to kind of achieve the high performance and robustness that control systems are able to, uh, you know, to attain even in unstable systems. Okay, so sensor measurements are critical. We need especially fast sensor measurements. And so in this video, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more detail on why we need uh, sensors, why we need them to be fast, the issues of time delays, uh, what types of sensing strategies are out there, and how they fit into this larger control diagram. Okay, so if you can't tell, I think measurements are absolutely critical for us to be able to effectively uh, suppress the spread of this disease and to keep it suppressed and under control. We need effective measurements. We need extensive uh, and accurate and fast measurements. Okay, um, so there's a great article in the IEEE Spectrum, I encourage you to check this out, where they talk about different control strategies and how control can help us uh, understand and control this, uh, this spread. One of the concerns people have, uh, so we've been kind of suppressing the spread of this disease by uh, global widespread efforts of you know, social distancing, no handshakes, limiting large gatherings, uh, stay shelter in place laws, things like that. Okay, so a massive global effort to keep this disease suppressed. What people are worried about is that once we start to lift those restrictions, once we start to open up and to go back to work and to go back to school and go back about our daily lives, people are worried that this might have a resurgence, this, this disease might rebound and we might have to go into quarantine again and again and again. And that's a, you know, that's a pretty big concern. We don't want to do that. We don't want to keep doing this on, off, bang, bang control. And one of the only ways that we can, you know, at least from a control theory perspective, prevent that kind of course uh, control is through more effective sensor measurements. Okay, so, so one alternative is to use feedback control to measure the system and measure the system extensively enough and quickly enough that you can essentially maintain this, uh, this level that's below the healthcare capacity without doing this, this big bang bang control uh, that might last months or, or even years, okay? But to do this feedback control strategy to enact uh, this, this feedback control, you need to have enough measurements of your system that are accurate enough and fast enough to be, to be useful in real time, okay? So um, I also wanna point out these measurements are, are not used alone. We're gonna use these measurements with our models. So I wanna remind you, uh, this is a great New York Times article comparing five coronavirus models. We have lots of models of uh, the spread of this disease, but all of those models give different predictions, and that's okay. We know that our models are imperfect, but they're still useful for, for control. But I just want to point out, uh, if you have models that are this different, this kind of model, uh, diversity and uncertainty, we absolutely need to also be taking measurements, extensive measurements of our system to pin these models and to correct our feedback uh, control that uh, is kind of balancing our models and our measurements. Okay, so that's what we're, we're talking about is essentially, you know, we know that we have imperfect models. We are not exactly sure how effective our controllers are going to be. So we absolutely rely on our measurements of our system to see how uh, the actual system is responding. Okay, so what are some of the types of measurements and tests that we can take in this system? Uh, and there's, there's a lot at our disposal. So um, 
One thing you can do is test for symptoms. You know, does someone have a fever? Um, you know, do they, they do they have the symptoms of of coronavirus? Another type of test you can test for antibodies uh, in in the patient. So this is called serological testing. Um, for example, you know, what proportion of uh, citizens in Manhattan have antibodies, meaning that they have already had or currently have, um, you know, this this virus. You can also test directly for uh, this RNA from the virus to see if that is currently in, in the patient. So there's all kinds of tests that you can do. And some of these are faster and some of these are slower than others. So for example, um, you know, in, in some Southeast Asian countries, there are apps on your phone. So you take your fever twice a day and you enter those numbers into this app and it goes into a central database so that they can kind of track the progression of symptoms over time. So symptoms might be, might be really fast to measure. Antibodies and RNA, those take longer, right? You have to maybe measure some you know, swab and send it to a lab and, and maybe there's a queue. So there are different time delays for these different measurements. Now, implicit in all of this, there is a bigger time delay, which is, um, so I'm gonna point out that time delays are a big problem here. There is a time delay of incubation. So when you catch the virus, there is some period maybe before you express symptoms and antibodies and so on and so forth. And so those time delays make this a really, really hard sensing problem and it motivates having a larger sensor network. There's also issues with statistical bias. So if you only test people who are sick and who have severe symptoms, who go to the hospital, you're going to get a massively skewed uh, sample of what the actual population statistics look like. And that's a huge problem. So we know uh, that there are many asymptomatic carriers who have had uh, COVID-19 and didn't show symptoms. And if you only test people in the hospital, you get a massively skewed number of all of the important parameters that you need to use when you're modeling the system, okay? So it's super important to get um, to test sick and healthy people to take random testing of the population. Um, one thing that they actually do are, are sewage tests. I think this is super interesting is that you can actually measure the sewage output from a city and you get this very coarse measurement of kind of how that uh, city, you know, maybe you're testing for antibodies or, or RNA or something like that. Uh, and a lot of these tests are kind of standard, uh, you know, th they teach these in biology classrooms in colleges across the country. The equipment exists. This is, you know, standard stuff. It's just, you know, to ramp this up at a scale of an entire country, you know, is, is very challenging uh, to do this kind of testing in mass. Okay, good. So, um, you know, I feel very fortunate to live in the Pacific Northwest where there are huge efforts ongoing. Actually, a lot of this has been funded uh, by the Gates Foundation and others. There are institutes like the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the Institute for Disease Modeling, that are focused on modeling these kinds of disease systems and health systems and modeling the data that you get from these kinds of sensor networks. Uh, there's also the Seattle Flu Study, which was already in place to measure the progression of flu as it spreads across a network of people in a city. Uh, and recently they have ramped up and combined with other organizations to create this Seattle Coronavirus uh, Assessment Network, which essentially is measuring uh, all of these hard to measure variables to try to quantify the, you know, the, the nuances of the spread of coronavirus. Um, in, in Seattle. So I think that's really cool. And this is really important to have these kinds of modeling and sensing networks already in place. So I think one of the reasons that uh, Southeast Asia has been pretty effective in their efforts to contain COVID-19 is because years earlier they had the SARS scare. They were really worried that SARS was gonna do exactly what COVID-19 is doing now. And so they put in lots of infrastructure and sensor networks and surveillance networks because of SARS, because they knew that this, this could happen. And so they had that infrastructure in place. Uh, and that's something that you know is absolutely vital if you really want good, effective, um, kind of responsive control over your system, you need to be measuring more than just 
how many people are sick every day in a city. Okay, that's not enough. We need more uh, detailed measurements in time. Okay, um, and, you know, so I've already shown you lots about the models we use uh, for these systems and the models we use to, to, to try to design control strategies. But all of these parameters, the recovery rate, the infection rate, all of the parameters of these models and how they affect different population groups, different age groups, different um, socioeconomic groups, you know, from city to city, these parameters are different. And under different social distancing and different control strategies, all of these parameters are different. That's what we're trying to control. But you need extensive and accurate measurements to understand what these parameters are and how effective your control strategies are. So I think that's really important. You absolutely need um, you know, extensive measurements to, to get good models to make effective control decisions, especially since we have time delays. We need our models to be as good as possible, and so we need all of the information uh, that we can get our hands on. So um, I've already talked a lot about time delays, both in this video and in others. Um, in my mind, when I think about the spread of coronavirus and our efforts uh, kind of within the US and internationally, I am you know, constantly thinking about time delays. Because as a control theorist, I know that these are some of the trickiest issues that you ever have to deal with in a control system is when there are time delays between what you measure uh, and, and what actually is happening in the system, or between when you think you've enacted a control strategy and when it actually becomes effective, or when you think that you know, someone is showing symptoms and when they actually got infected and infected others. Time delays are really, really tricky. Um, and so I think that we absolutely have to be thinking about our surveillance networks, knowing what we know about time delays and how they, they uh, affect robust performance. So a lot of times if you make control decisions and you have time delays in your system, you can get unstable responses where you're kind of doing the wrong control at the wrong time because there's a delay and your system can go unstable. That's a really big issue. And so, uh, you know, one strategy when you have these big time delays is to have good models that predict where your system is going to be. You make decisions based on that. And then on a slower supervisory time scale, you make corrections based on the measurements you're taking. And those measurements can improve the model, which improves the kind of uh, aggressiveness with which you can make fast control decisions. So the measurements are good for both the modeling and for the feedback and really are, are quite essential. Uh, there's already discussions about software um, you know, to track are people you know, properly socially distancing to collect that information. Um, you know, this is a pretty simple computer vision problem now, actually. I mean, this is, this is commercial. Um, there's also discussions about whether or not we should have, you know, thermal scans at airports and in train stations and places. So can we measure, does someone have a fever uh, in real time? Okay. And this brings up a lot of privacy concerns. So, you know, having an extensive surveillance network and having uh, measurements of your system is critical for good feedback control. But there are big privacy concerns. Do we want to ramp up a massive surveillance network? Um, that's something that you know is a real concern and something that we really need to think about. I mean, we all are carrying uh, you know essentially a big suite of sensors, and it tells us where we are and how close to people we are when we go to crowded areas. Um, you know, there is a tremendous amount of data that could be tapped, um, and there are big societal questions that we have to ask and answer about uh, how to use that data responsibly, whether we do, how much of it to use, things like that. Those are, um, you know, bigger than any one of us can can decide. Okay, um, good. So, you know. I hope I've kind of convinced you of how important this measurements and sensors are in this feedback loop and how we can really only get the kind of control performance we need if we have fast, accurate sensors. Um, there's a lot of talk now about contact tracing, which basically means if you have a sick person, can you go and trace all of the people they've been in contact with and then test them and uh, try to contain and do a much more isolated quarantine uh, that way. This is also, again, happening in lots of other countries around the world uh, to varying degrees of effectiveness. This is what a lot of people call um, 
boot leather epidemiology or boots on the ground. It takes a lot of people, a lot of resources to go do that detective work of contact tracing. That's another kind of sensor network uh, that we can deploy at a, at a finer, more granular level. Um, okay, good. So I hope I've given you some some feeling for how hard of a problem this is. Uh, there are you know ethical societal concerns. There are technological concerns. There are practical concerns about the time delays um, that your sensors will inevitably have uh, in this control architecture. But I do firmly believe that if you want to do a good job, you need to be uh, extensively measuring your system. All right. Thank you. <laughs>